Welcome to the Learning to Die podcast. I'm Ian Dunican. And I'm Kieran O'Regan. How do I live when I know I must die? We explore areas of philosophy, psychology, martial arts, culture, existential risk, history, society, religion, science, and anything else that seems of interest and relevance to answering that question. We can only hope that some of what we learn might be of benefit to you too. Namaste, sapiens. <laughs> Off you go, Gordon. Sorry. <laughs> I think it was October uh, 62, and um, because they found the missiles, uh, offensive missiles in Cuba, right? And um, Kennedy's, uh, Kennedy's uh, um, cabinet wanted to uh, do a preemptive strike on the, on, on the island, right? Blow them up. I mean, they were really, uh, they were really into that. It was he, just he and I think his brother were against it doing it right away. And um, so uh, they, you know, they put this blockade on, uh, went back and forth with Khrushchev and everything. So the Americans put this blockade on on Cuba uh, and uh, wouldn't let any ships in and we're waiting to see whether the Russians would ship out their offensive weapons. And so everyone was waiting to see what would, I mean, it, I mean, people were like, it was, it was, it was a really strong feeling. This is it. You know, people were building bomb shelters back then and everything. And uh, Khrushchev was pretty adamant. And, uh, and uh, so the, everyone was waiting to see. So the thing was they, uh, when they, Russians said they were sending their um, sending the missiles back. They had to be stopped by American ships and inspected, right? And so the whole world was fucking holding its breath. Excuse me, holding its breath to see whether the Russians would stop, right? And they did. And the uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, and uh, but the other part of the deal was that um, Kennedy had to secretly uh, agree to move our offensive missiles out of Turkey, right? But the really scary part was, um, was first off, the guy Kennedy was on amphetamines all the time and steroids. Really amazing. <laughs> yeah, because he had his, you know, I think a great book to write about the impact of uh, of methamphetamine on like uh, on politics. Again, uh, Mao was on him. Uh, Hitler got shot up every morning. Uh, mm -hmm. Kennedy was on him. And uh, he was also, because he had Addison's disease, he was also on steroids, right? And here he is, and, and the rest of them, the, the crazy generals are going, let's, let's blow Cuba out of, the, out of the water, right? But the, uh, later on, I found out that the uh, Russians had, I think, three submarines there that had the, um, and they were in the Sea of Sargosa, which was for weeks, in like 110 degrees in those submarines. And uh, they had lost contact with Moscow and they had the ability to, uh, they had the authority to uh, launch nuclear missiles if they thought the war had started. Mm -hmm. So we started dropping, um, we finally found them, Americans finally found them, start, started dropping depth charges. Now apparently there's a distinction between, uh, there's a signal, you drop three depth charges, something like this, it means we're just trying to bring you up, you drink, drop four, it means we're trying to destroy you. Bringing you down. <laughs> and, um, I think there was a miscalculation there, and so uh, two of the subcommanders said, "Let's let's let these nuclear weapons go," and one guy said, "No." And uh, we did a podcast about him. Actually, his name was Vasily Arkhipov. Yeah, we did an we did an episode we did of a him, podcast yeah. about that that commander. It was Vasily wow. Arkhipov was his name. Yeah, that one guy. He was the flotilla commander. Yeah. Yeah. What happened yeah. when he got back? Was he chastised for that or what? Yeah, I think so. He fortunately he was on the one sub that um, he, he he because he was able to outrank the the the, the sub captain and the Communist Party member who had to be on the sub. Both of them wanted to launch, and even from the Soviet records, we read out a quote that was there from the Soviet records on that particular episode, and uh, the the Soviet commander was like. Uh, the, the, the captain was shouting and losing his shit and basically saying, 
we're not going to fucking let Mother Russia down. We're going to take them all with us. And then he wanted to just let the nukes, let the nukes go and put mushroom clouds all over the place oh, above the, uh, on, on the yeah. water because they were surrounded. Yeah. But it was Arkhipov, I believe Arkhipov had, had noticed that there was a particular rhythm, like you had said, to the depth charges. Yeah, so, just, so he knew yeah. that he was like, but, but as you said at the time, the, the, they had lost um, a lot of power and there was carbon, monoc- the carbon dioxide poisoning rising and fellas were passing out and the temperatures were, were like 110 plus degrees. Right, Guys were right. passing out, panicking and everything. And, um, and yeah, and that he was just cool and calm enough under pressure to be able to recognize the pattern and say, they're not trying to block, bomb us. They're trying to get us to surface. And at that time, as you said, they'd lost communications as well. So you had like peak yeah. Cold War, Cuban Missile Crisis, fellas Castro out, wanted, carbon dioxide. And Castro wanted to go down with a ship. He, he wanted to, he was pissed off at the Russians for, for not letting the nukes go. Yeah, yeah. That was, um, and, and that was one of the closest moments ever in human, there was, there yeah. was a, there was like two of those moments. There was, um, there was Vasily Arkhipov, I think, but I think he ended up between a, a kind of a rock and a hard place because he didn't, what he did didn't become known, I think, until the early 2000s after the Soviet really? Union fell and a lot of records came out and everything. And then it became, it became known what he, and he ended up receiving a thing called the, uh, the Future of Life Award, um, which is okay. an organization based out of Boston and everything but his family received it after he died but um he because it was all soviet records and there was a similar thing where it didn't come out until the two th- early 2000s as well with uh this got that fella there that ian just had on the screen stanislav petrov who was a commander in a radio base that was looking or not a radio base a radar some kind of a, a um a satellite base to look at incoming missiles and there was a similar thing with him where he realized that there must be a technical fault because yeah, yeah, if the yeah. Americans are going to shoot, they wouldn't just shoot five. There'd be hundreds of them. They'd fill up the whole screen. Right, right. I heard so, about that one, yeah. 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 yeah There's pretty, these near misses. Talk about and, the and fragility, I, fragility of life, right? Yeah. Well, I think and, you, you mentioned that in your, uh, in, in your excellent essay uh, about you know, how it's just this little mistake and that's it, right? Yeah. That's the, that's the mad situation that we're in. And, and I, I think... The reason that we, we wanted to chat is it's, I, never, I didn't realize we were going to kick off with the Cuban Missile Crisis because a lot of people have said it's a good, it's a brilliant starting point though because loads of historians and analysts on this whole nuclear war and, and just warfare have, have, are, are saying that this is the most dangerous moment in history since the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's Definitely. the most, that's the anchor that people yeah. are going back to. Yeah. Historic anchor. Yeah, but I, I would even say, I don't, I don't know, yeah. Definitely since equal to it, but uh, I've never heard anybody say the kind of stuff Putin said, for example, today, when they uh, yeah. launched those intercontinental, they tested those missiles. He's twice threatened uh, nuclear weapons, and I can't ever recall any other that ever happened before where the person actually threatened using them. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's the that's the. And and you'd want you'd wonder yeah it's it's so hard you, you don't want to be like psychoanalyzing from a distance but it's just from like seeing authoritarian regimes seeing here learning about them and and just imagining the process when you end up with this situation where you in 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 someone like his situation where he's surrounded by people who are afraid to hand him bad news they're afraid to ask difficult questions and they're afraid to say no imagine you have twenty years of that. And then what your view of the world is in terms of the um, intel that you're getting provided and the information you're getting provided and how detached your worldview may actually be from reality if you're potentially not. Like the, the most worrying thing is that the most concerning thing with Putin is if, if, he's, if he's not, if, if he genuinely is a rational actor given his axiomatic basis of what he thinks is going on. You know, that's that's much more concerning than if he was some psychopath or some gangster or something who's just trying to play people. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, you in, in your essay, you, uh, you mentioned, Gordon, that and this is this I think this will build into the, the theme we wanted to talk about. But I, you mentioned that that a lot of existentialism really came to the fore around the Cold War and everything. So wh- wh- how would you. In that era, there in like the 50s, 60s, and stuff like 70s, around the Cold War, how would you 
and after and obviously second world war and everything but how would you introduce that to someone who hasn't who, who, who i'd recommend anyone who's listening to this would go and read your piece but how would you um explain that the rise of existentialism around that era well both the, i mean it also was very popular after the first world war so the sense of the irrationality of humanity right our, mm. uh, our, the limits of rationality which is such an important theme in existentialism so uh, that's why you know uh, it's very popular for both wars, you know. Mm. Uh, I think so. This, this idea of the limits of rationality. You know? Gordon, for somebody who may not be familiar with your work previously or familiar with philosophy terms, how would you describe existentialism? Well, again, existentialism is it's a it's a it's a movement that's connected by certain themes: the individual choice, freedom. Um, uh, limits of rationality. So whatever, there's always a, whenever people put together collections of existentialists, it's always a, quite a, a, a wide variety of, uh, mm. of uh, quite, a, quite a wide roster of people, but it's really themes that connect them. Okay. You know, okay. And, and also for someone like you know, this, for someone like Kierkegaard, the distinction between a theoretical understanding and a, uh, and a practical understanding, right? Is it, you know, there's two, uh, two senses of truth. There's an abstract truth. And then there's, that, that's why I was nervous about even writing about this stuff because uh, I mean, I, I'm not in uh, Mary Paul. I've never been in that situation. So who am I to really you know, uh, pontificate about what's, what's the right thing to do? Yeah, so mm-hmm. th- that's an important distinction for some of the existentialists is theoretical understanding versus your personal appropriation of the ideas you espouse. Right. Yeah. Do you, really, do you really walk the talk? Is when, cliche. when I read your essay, Gordon, I really like that. You know, I think you said to that, said that in the essay, you said something about there's, there's un, to, to understand and to understand are two different things. And yeah. it reminded me actually of theoretical physics, physics and applied. And it's a bit like in martial arts as well. There's always that guy who can tell you what to do. And it doesn't, yeah. and it doesn't mean, and it doesn't mean that he doesn't know because there's some great right. coaches right. out there that haven't been great boxers because some guys oh, are yeah. just really good at reading the player, but then practically yeah. can't Dundee. do it. My mentor, Angelo Dundee. Yeah. Box. Or in jujitsu, a guy called John Danaher who hasn't probably practiced jujitsu in years. He's got bad legs and hips and so on, but he's like this fucking wizard. Like when I come to say coaching yeah. people. So you he, yeah, yeah, you can see things. So there is, there is the two. And it just reminded me of, theoretical phys- physics and applied physics. And I, and I often use that sometimes in my consulting work in businesses. I'm like, yeah, you've got all the ideas, but you've never done a practical day's work in your life because you haven't got behind it there. So right. you, you think but, you know, but, the, but you don't actually know, you know? But, but the question I'm trying to raise in the most radical, don't say the most radical choice is uh, whether to um, engage this threat of nuclear war, uh, even though it might... Uh, Destroy, I mean, destroy the lives of people who have nothing to do with any of this stuff. Mm. America, Americans, I mean, Germans, Germans were after the weapon. How many Russians were too? Yeah. We, we developed it. Americans developed it. I mean, the responsibility there of like, uh, uh, we've decided to, uh, you know, so at what, at what point? Um, so I, I, I think there's a, a question there that um, really the, and then it's a, kind of question it's hard to come up with what kind of criterion you use to answer it it's a, what what course of action would save the most lives uh you know uh is there um do the sovereign rights of a nation trump everything else uh uh so i i think we're getting i i think we're going to get i, I think we're getting to that point the stuff going on in Mar- mariupol right now i mean you know I and, think uh, but, is, but, is... good i'm sorry well, so this this is the very question that we both ended up obviously thinking about, and uh, and then I I'd only come across your your own piece. I was sitting on this essay for a couple of weeks and I didn't know what to do with it. And then and then when I read yours, I was like, this there's a particular paragraph in yours that just it 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 struck me. It, it enticed me to publish just to publish my essay on, on my Substack because I wanted to read this. There's two paragraphs that kind of summarize. Um, not summarize, but that help to encapsulate this. What, this, this, because this, it's even trying to formulate the question is difficult, and what it is we're actually trying to say. It's almost like, it's almost like, what are we? It, it, what are we willing to risk? What do we actually value? And you, you sum it up brilliantly in this particular paragraph. So, from your piece, you said, 
It does not take much imagination to appreciate the radical choice Ukrainians faced in whether or not to stay and fight against a seemingly indomitable foe. From an existential perspective, such life and death decisions thrust us into an excruciating awareness of our own agency. They slam us against the core of our being, forcing us to answer, who are you? What do you ultimately value? Yeah. That... But don't you think the harder question is what right to, do we have to uh, risk, the, risk the health of the world uh, because, uh, because we value, say, freedom of thought? You know, I mean, that's the one mm. I think that's, yeah. I mean, there, there was one, I, I don't know about this stuff, but probably one simulation of what would happen if um, we started to get into this strategic nuclear weapon exchange. Yeah. And they said 90 million people would die. And God knows what would happen all over the world. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's what that's, that's what the study came from Harvard. So it has to be true. You know, so, but I mean, I think that's the larger question is, it's one it's one one thing for me to say I don't want to live if I can't have freedom of thought or freedom of expression. It's another, another thing for me to say, well, people in uh in Africa are, are gonna to have to sacrifice their lives because it's, this is the, the uh, decision I made. You know what I mean? That's the that's the one that really I really have a hard time with. Is yeah, I, that's I, and I'm that's, willing to I sacrifice could, other people's lives. Other yeah, people's and lives I could, I, I, nothing to do with this. There's, a, there's an interesting, um, I don't know, kind of a thread to this where I, I think when we look at it that from that level as technology current stand, currently stands with the threats that we currently know about at the moment and that are pressing us, that's the, that, that, I think that's the way to view the question is, is like, if the way the way I summed it up here, I, I kind of, it's funny because this paragraph that I, I'll, I'll read here, it's, it mirrors yours so much. Where I said, um, in tribe, long, long, long time war correspondent Sebastian Younger writes, yeah, I mean, What uh, would yeah. you risk dying for and for whom is perhaps the most profound question a person can ask themselves? A most profound question indeed, and one for which many, one for which many Ukrainians are answering not with words but deeds. However, at a moment of possible catastrophic great power of conflict, there is another brain-twisting conundrum facing the West. Is violence capable of escalating to the non-existence of humanity justified in trying to resist the expansion of tyrannical imposition? That's it. I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Part. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the question... This is, yeah. this, this is something I thought about from probably about the age of 19. I, I served in the military for five years and I went to the Middle East on a UN mission. And it's not like being in a war. You're an observer, you're doing patrols, you're looking for IEDs, yeah. you're patrolling villages, a bit of humanitarian thing. And at 19 years of age, you see this senseless back and forth between Hezbollah and the Israelis. Right. And you see the Israelis coming in, you hit, hitting villages and so on. And you think to yourself at 19, because you're seeing it right in front of you, like five, 600, 700 meters away, you go, what the fuck is the point of this? He hits him, he hits her. He hits him, he hits her. Like whatever it is, back and forth, back and forth. And it really makes, it really made me think about reflecting back to what went on in Ireland over time. And I came out of that with the conclusion at 19, there is no benefit to war. Now, is war, yeah, justif well, is war justified at certain times? Most likely. But at the end of the oh. day, I'd even take a step back from what, what you guys are saying. And, and another part <clears throat> that reinforces to me was when Karen and I did the episode on Hiroshima and we looked at the bombing. And when I was researching that episode, there was tears in my eyes looking at that. And you think to yourself, on one hand, it was justified in ending World War II and maybe more and more people could have died. And there was estimations like what you're talking right. about, Gordon. There was estimations about what would happen in yeah. the Pacific Theater and how many people would yeah, die. That was a big part of the argument. You told yeah, there was the, that was the whole argument. But on the other hand, you think to yourself, how the fuck are we capable of doing that to people? Because when you see the pictures of what happened there and the ramifications that to the people in Japan, even probably up until today, you think, how was that justified? And like what you're saying, Gordon, is like, you know, are we willing to sacrifice this for this? But really, if we come back up to a higher level, and Karen, you made me think about this in your article when you quoted Martin Luther King, because we read that same book recently. And you think about it, 
you know, that love needs to conquer all and we need to choose light and not dark. And it's sort of like, we're, I know we're at this stage now with Putin, but really what we should have done was never got to this stage. We really shouldn't have got to this stage. And it made me really think about actions and ramifications as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we, right. and we, could, we, could, pick apart, we could pick apart the NATO thing since the early 90s, since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And this kind right. of 30 years, this has pushed this on. And we're not, and, you know, that's a big kind of geopolitical nitpicking argument. But it just makes me think about, be very careful of the action we do today, because the ramifications, what that has into the future is really, really important. And what do you think about the fact that, I mean, Russia lost 27 million people during World War II, their population could have been, I mean, it's, I think it was 180 million now. I mean, I can't imagine what it was then, 27. Mm -hmm. So you think about the, um, the, the, the intergenerational um, uh, 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 impact of war, you know? I, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, for, for example, I believe Putin, Putin was in Stalin, Putin, Putin's family was in Stalingrad, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, just the level of, yeah, and like people say, well, look how, um, look how indifferent he is to the number of people getting killed. Well, 27 million, and then, and then on top of that, Stalin coming in afterwards, with God knows how many millions of people he killed. You know, mm -hmm. so you think about the effects of that on the psyche, right? I mean, I mean, Americans, Americans, my, my uncle's killed, but we lost 419,000. Second most was, uh, I think, China. China was the second most casualties from Japan. You know, mm. millions and millions, but 27 million in Russia. You know, so. But that's, but this is an interesting component to this, which um, I I didn't really expand upon in in the essay is, is so when, when you when you look at the the three ways that the best that we that you can kind of categorize that the best possible futures to humanity could be closed off. It's obviously is complete extinction, go away to dinosaurs. Two would be some kind of unrecoverable civilizational collapse. And right. three, like some kind of Mad Max world, except not sexy and not with cars, you know. And then three, and then the third one would be locked in techno tyranny, just like 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 Ben Thammy in Panopticon but yeah. Orwell 1984 on steroids kind of a thing where you know surveillance tech locked in you know and um and with, with those three the thing about the matter even the third one if we were because if you take if you just look if you just use the extremes of this situation as an example of like one on one extreme you could just say well the the in the short term the best way to save as many lives as possible is, 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 is quite possibly something like complete surrender and just let Putin do what he wants in terms of just take the place. That's what but the Danes did. That's what the Danes did. Yeah. Yeah. Against Hitler. Yeah. Yeah. Ahead, and I, and I think, yeah, well, no, but, no, but in, in, in that kind of, in that example, but the, the fascinating thing now is because we're all so globally connected and so aware if if you were to take if you were to carry that out and go well why would why would Putin if he just raises the same threat to the next country and the next country and then just rebuild the Soviet bloc but in in this new in this new image and or or, or keep going or join up with China and build this new thing and just go and take whatever they want you know because this, right. this, the, the, in the short term the most amount of lives might be saved but the fascinating thing though when you look at it from an existential risk lens apart from even the from an existentialism lens around the value of freedom and freedom of choice and the capacity to be able to speak your mind that that's and think and have a freedom of mind and be able to express yourself. But I think when you're looking at it from an existential risk lens, the thing about it is, is that even if you do that, we're st you're still potentially just setting the ground for humanity to still get goosed, not only because of the human suffering and the uh, atrocities and the human rights that we now consider to be human rights atrocities that could take place under a, a tyrannical kind of global cabal situation you know if everyone just surrendered to whatever country is threatens nuclear weapons and is and, and then if the nato countries that say are unwilling to use them in return and you just give up but then you end up with scenarios where you end up with less scientific innovation to be able to deal with future threats like Figuring out yeah, ways. It was scientific of, innovation that gave us the bomb. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's the double-edged sword I mean, that's of the irony of, about it, right? Yeah. I mean, it was scientific innovation that gave us the bomb. 
Yeah, but I think, and and, and the, the the fascinating thing of the of the 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 weapons is that, or the, the technology is that it is that double edged sword. But then at the same time, you end up with, um, and the interconnectivity where we're more fragile. But at the same time, it's it's also scientific innovation and engineering that allowed. NASA scientists and scientists around the world to map all the large asteroids in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s when they realized that that's what had taken out the dinosaurs. Do you know, so when you look at humanity's like oh, yeah. deep future, oh, yeah. so yeah. when you when you, yeah. when you take that kind of and and on, on other things as well, other other components of um like obviously things like medicines, etc., and to be able to deal with pandemics and viruses and but when you look at even totalitarian situations around something like the, the coronavirus pandemic and you look at the very origins of that is that it potentially just became a, a Chinese Chernobyl because of standard Communist Party procedure to, to silence people who were inconvenient like that Dr. Li Wen Liang oh, okay, who tried okay. to warn his colleagues etc. If I can just interrupt you for a second though um, <laughs> you know they said well would the Chinese take to be virtuous uh, there's different tables of virtue with different co cultures, right? And what I think the Chinese, Chinese take to be virtuous is stability, right? And that's also why I don't think they'd ever go for a war because they want markets and stability. So mm -hmm. uh, that's what they take to be the good life in a lot of ways. So who are we to tell them that's wrong? You know, I mean, like, yeah. what's the argument there? They say there's nothing more important than a stable community. In fact, I dealt with, I, I might be wrong about this, but I've dealt with a different university Chinese students. They didn't have this big thing about cheating. Cheating wasn't like the worst thing in the world. Worst yeah. thing in the world would be the worst thing in the world would be you know, just causing causing trouble and just you know disturbing your community. You know, mm -hmm. so it's a different view of the good life. You know, and, and, and in that sense, I do think I don't think you'll see China getting eager to start start a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. You know, but. Uh, so it could be a different different understanding of what the value of life is, mm. you know? Do you, think, do you think that's a problem that we have, guys, that we tend to, and I'll use the West collectively for for, for all our respective countries, do we have a tendency just to- After, after our fucking bloody history of subjugation, of so yeah. many people, hey, I mean, don't, mass murder, right? Don't, I mean, don't, like, don't, don't blame us, we're fucking Irish, we're neutral, we didn't do anything. <laughs> we just sat here getting the shit kicked out of us by the Brits. So don't don't, don't don't for a hundred years. Don't do that with a couple don't, of Irish friends. Don't, don't, don't yeah. be blaming don't be blaming me going for the American stuff. You're right. <laughs> yeah. No 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 blacks no dogs no Irish. Yeah, there that you was go. The, that was the that was the that was the posters. No blacks <laughs> no dogs no Irish. Well, I, I have a T-shirt. I have a T-shirt that says more dogs, more blacks, more Irish. <laughs> but do you, do you now I forgot what I was going to say. But do you guys think that um in 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 Western culture we have this kind of you know, virtuous type of, I think, smarmy stance that everybody should just behave like we do and our ethics should be like Chinese people should just behave like us. Japanese people should behave like us. Russians should behave like us. Not only behave, we, but value we, we value. Exactly. Right? And that's what I mean. Right? Right? Like have every, yeah. value what we do and sort of like we are the way, we are the truth, we are the light. You do what we do. And if you don't do it, you're bad. And it's just okay, really kind of good and bad. Black and white. Time, but but, you hear that, but I, I've heard that in places like, uh, maybe in Saudi Arabia, I forget what it was, that, that they did polls of women, and, and women were in favor of the system. What then? You know? Yeah. I'm going to say, like, <laughs> we're, we're a democrat. We want you to, we have democratic values, but if you if you like this, uh, this undemocratic system, yeah. that's... <laughs> There's something wrong with you or something. It's 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 kind of patronizing. I mean, but that's a bit that's a bit like what's happening now in the world, Gordon. Is like I think if we look at what's happening on the let's say the left side of politics, which should be for free speech, is about curation and moderation of speech more than any time ever. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that's the same. That's the same thing as well. It's like we want democracy, free speech. You know, be, being a when I was growing up in the eighties and nineties, being being left was very much about you know supporting the working class. It was about everybody doing well, lifting everybody up. Yeah. It was about freedom of speech, freedom of thought. Everybody had an opportunity. And now it's like, I, I can't even describe what it is now. I have Man, no idea what people, it is now. Some of my friends on the left, they're like, they're, they're sending out articles about, uh, you know, how the, how the, the uh, press is misleading. Putin's not that bad. 
But that's been happening from day one, Gordon. If you pick up a newspaper yeah. 40 years ago, there was there was misrepresentation. I don't think this is anything new. I think I think the fact of the matter is that it's more in your face now and there's more sources, so people are more aware of it. But let's 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 dig back into the past. There's been fuckery by media and governments and people since the time of Rome or before that. It's not new. It's just that it's more in our face these days. It's like when you say to people, oh, when they talk, um, Karen, you mentioned it there about um, the scientists in America in the 60s. You look into the history of NASA. That's basically Nazi scientists. You look oh, at that. You, you look at Operation about, Paperclip. About, uh, oh, the guy who the guy developed the uh, V2 rockets. Um, Werner von Braun. Werner von yeah. Braun, yeah. Von That's, von, uh, if you, yeah. There's a great book called Operation Paperclip. No Nuremberg trial for him. No, Operation, <laughs> Operation Paperclip. And that was the operation that brought those Nazi scientists to, Na- to NASA. And people are like, that never happened. I'm like, it's fucking well documented. Like, so you just want to choose what you want to hear, you know, but okay, Nazis this and punch a Nazi. Question. Nazis got what's you to the moon. Answer, what's our answer to this question? I mean, suppose, okay, so right now, Mary Paul, apparently there's, and the reports I'm getting from, uh, they're, they're, I mean, they're saying what, there's seven, what was it, 7,000 people in that uh, steel plant. Is that right? Okay, so they got these bunker busters. Mm. Suppose, uh, the Russians going to just kill all those people. What what will be enough for us to say? We're at the, I mean, I, uh, to say, okay, look, um, uh, we're going to have a humanitarian corridor. If you attack if you attack us, uh, so be it. We're going to do something to stop this. Even though even though he's definitely <coughs> nuclear a nuclear response and there are many people think he's capable of yeah right because in part because this distinction he draws between strategic nuclear weapons and and others tactical yeah 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 tactical. right tactical that's right tactical yeah tactical. yeah there's no, yeah. There's no tactical use of nuclear <laughs> yeah <laughs> like some, some, pre- some some let's use some precision nuclear weaponry you know yeah, i know like, yeah. a, like a sniper like yeah know? Yeah. Like shoot, just shoot, okay. just, t- just we'll just take the apple off the top of the head and give him a warning <laughs> shot. <you know? laughs> yeah, with a nuke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll just wipe out two or three, <laughs> two or three million people just for a warning shot. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's but the other thing, Karen. People don't understand what a nuclear weapon does. I've heard people say, "Why don't they just nuke Moscow?" It's like, fuck, like man, really? Like I felt that way a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, what I think I I I I really appreciate your the the that question going because what that line is and what it entails because if you take even if you just look at it like if you if you take it from the, the kind of existentialism view and and or you know, let's say just let's take the existential risks off out of it around the potential for innovative processes to identify future risks and to, to try and help humanity's long-term future etc and you just look at it in terms of right now a lot of the decision is like the way the way i thought about it seems to be quite similar to you in, t- in terms of if you decide to make a move and then nuclear war kicks off. Then you end up with people that are just living their lives in South America and all over Africa and all and countries that have nothing got to do with any of this. And they're just living daily life, doing their thing. And they might be living in more or less repressive regimes with their, what they're doing, whatever they do, family, wife, just doing, putting food on the table, going to work in the morning, going to school. And they are going to suffer the consequences of particulate matter in the high atmosphere that blocks out yeah. the sun and makes it harder to grow food for five years or ten years or whatever, depending on how many weapons are used. Because that's the that's the th- that's the thing with these nuclear weaponry. Right. Like, like right. I, 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 a lot of the, the the climate modeling and there's some disputes around it, but some of the climate modeling from some of the people who would have originally discovered the nuclear winter concept in the 1980s with Carl Sagan, the more the most recent stuff from like 2019. And uh, it basically even uh, plots out that they see if you had India and Pakistan fired about 50 weapons each at each other and they mapped it out and then they mapped at their cities, you still end up with 10% global food shortages just because of a localized exchange where India and Pakistan fire about 10% 10 global food shortages just when you have India and Pakistan fire about a third of their weapons each. So they have about 150 weapons each. They fire 50 each at each other Oh, because of some escalation over Kashmir and then all of a sudden, yeah. and then yeah. this is mapped out based on like the amount of stuff that could burn in these cities, etc. But when you think about that, but then when you look at America, with the West and America and Russia, even if you take all the rest of the countries out of it, like in Europe, you have France and and, uh, and Britain are both nuclear armed, but 
but America is really the big dog alongside Russia with like 4,000 weapons each, 5,000 weapons and each. And Ukraine like gave the weapons up voluntarily. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, even after, there's other consequences to this. Even if this managed to get peacefully resolved, you're going to end up with, if if if, if you're going to end up with a nuclear uh, arms race, they're not just where countries are going to want to get nukes just so they can't get bullied yeah. as easily. That's, yeah, that's an yeah, unfortunate yeah. repercussion of this situation because yeah. I think, well, if we had them, if Ukraine kept them, maybe they would have got rid of them, they would have been invaded, etc. But that's the thing. It's like, how? what does the line, as you said, and you put it really well there, it's like, what would even be the criterion? Like, is it better to be, to be living in a situation under the thumb than of, of some kind of regime or, in a, or is it better to try and orientate towards protecting the values that that we share around freedom of mind, freedom of expression, be able to not to be able to choose your leaders with ballot paper rather than bullet shells and bloodshed, and to be able okay, to. Okay, but wouldn't one, scenario, wouldn't one scenario be, okay, he takes over Ukraine, but he's so isolated, Putin's so isolated, and such as considered such a scourge, then that he's kind of he won't have the power that he had before. Mm. That's a possibility, isn't it? Yeah, I mean the way the world's turned off. The way there seems to be a consensus around the world about what he's doing. Yeah. And then it, I mean, but, it, but, but the, the other side of that is you could still end up needing to cross this bridge at some point if desperation point, yeah. is used because, because so it still, it still kind of means the conversation is unbelievably important because it's forcing us, like you said, it slams us against, I use your language around what do we actually value? What are we actually doing? What's important to us? What 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 are we willing to risk and what are we not willing to risk? What is what is what justifies the potential of annihilation? You know. Do you so think? Like Karen, that, that, do you think, Karen, to answer that question, that <clears throat> this is a very difficult question for us, even ir- irrespective of what's happening in Ukraine? What do we value? What do we value these days? Because I don't understand what we value as a society anymore. To come back to use this collective West, we're so divided internally, if we want to call it that. We're so focused on, you know, fighting with our neighbor these days. We're so focused on screaming at people over masks. We're so focused on the vision of left and right and, and you know, labor versus liberal or Republican versus Democrat. Do, do we even know what we value before we even ask that question? Well, you, people used to have a sense of it. Then God died. Meet <laughs> you. <laughs> But like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the, that's the, but that's the meaning crisis in the West, the fragmentation, the God-shaped hole, the fragmentation yeah. that resulted, this ideological yeah. fragmentation, people clamoring to, to fill that, that existential vacuum. And I, I, I wonder, is that a precursor question of what we value about why, when would we go into Russia? And, and so Because to me, there's like, what do we value? When would we intervene in Russia? Or can it be solved locally in terms of some sort of deal between Zelensky and Putin? And then do we end up with a Cold War II where Ukraine becomes the new Berlin, where the, mm. the, the Western forces push up to like Kiev or something? And, and, and this is what we spoke about, Karen, when we discussed the Ukrainian crisis. I think, I think that's going to be the outcome. I think that the Eastern states or provinces of Ukraine will be taken by the Russians, Crimea, Donbass, and Luensk, whatever, uh, how, how yeah, you pronounce yeah. those. I think those three areas will be probably controlled by Russia predominantly and the rest will be West. And maybe then NATO will push in or they'll sit on the borders of Poland and Lithuania and all these other countries. Because I think the more we push up against Putin, the more he pushes back. And this is, this is the other problem as well, is the more we funnel stuff in to Ukraine, are we just fucking poking the bear? These are all the things that I'm sort of in my head at the moment. Yeah, yeah. From, you know what okay, I mean? First on the value issue. We shouldn't act as though we just come up with our values on our own, though, right? I mean, yeah. like I grew up in this Italian family, you know, it was a wanting to be in the mob when I was a kid, all that stuff. That came from the, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that came from values that were, you know, from a, a certain culture, you know. Uh, so it's not as though we invent our values on our own. Mm. You know, our, our culture has a lot to do with that, right? So this obsession mm. with choice and freedom and as I said, I, I don't think I don't think Chinese uh, Chinese people have the same kind of values. Um, so, uh, but, but this question, I mean, like, what would it? Okay, if we go, what about if we go to King's solution, right? Right, that war is never good, right? I mean, um, not never good, but um, 
this is some Rhino Niebuhr uh, wrestled with a lot as a famous theologian, right? About whether or not to engage in World War II. Bonhoeffer went back to Germany, was in his resistance, got, was hanged. Um, uh, yeah, where, what, what, um, is he right? Is he right? Is it, is the, would the, would the pacifist, would, uh, um, would it be wrong to, to risk nuclear war over? So suppose we said, okay, so we said, we're going to, listen, we're going to have it, we're going to get, we want to get these people out of Mariupol. If you don't like it, fuck you, shoot us down. Then we'll, then we'll fight, right? Mm. Like that's 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 one alternative, right? We could that's even though without even getting involved like offensively. Okay. Um but um yeah, what what to, I don't know. And it, what do you think about the distinction between feeling of the like my feeling is like last night I was watching that stuff, I said, let's fight these motherfuckers. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's part of me like, okay, that's it, you know, that's it. Like, Really, we got to do something more than just, you know, right? And then you the, the, you think about it a little bit, and yeah. who you're putting at risk. Again, it's not just just like the the quote you have in your article. It's not just us we're putting at risk, right? Yeah. And that's <laughs> and that's the like I I I I, I kind of think about the uh, that I, I used it when I was t- I messaged you on Twitter, not to message you, I commented on Twitter that point that that Teddy Roosevelt quote. Of uh, speak softly would carry a big stick, big stick. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I think, it, but unfortunately, you end up with this kind of the opposite is kind of taking place where we have Western politicians that are speaking strongly without actually being clear about that. Maybe that's maybe strategic ambiguity or whatever they call it. But you have this constant backing of Putin into a corner talking about war crimes and war crimes. And when this is over, we're going to get oh, you yeah, in war really, crimes. He's really worried stuff. about. He's really worried yeah. about that, right? That's yeah, like, oh, I was I was I was Joe would have said to him the other day. He said, "Well, we have nuclear weapons that'll blah blah blah." And I think I, I I was I was hoping Joe would say, "Guess who else has them?" Yeah, but exactly. That might and be like, the asshole in me. That might be the yeah. asshole in me. But he ought to. He should. He should know that. Uh, he's gonna. I don't die. think it's. I'm, I'm thinking very similarly. I don't think it's a fucking coincidence that all three of us are involved in combat sport and and you American football and rugby. This fucking aggressionless. Like yeah. I was even when I was even talking about this with my friend yesterday. I kind of got a bit heated and I had I had this like, just fucking. If he wants to be a gangster, why don't we? Why don't the, why don't hear me? We as if I've anything to fucking do with this. But it's like the West. Like you want to be a gangster? We have fucking nukes too. Are you willing to go all the way? And oh, I was like, you see, we got no. France, England, everybody. <laughs> and he says, yeah. "Oh, I'm moving my. Or I'm going to move my our weapons closer to the border." Where I, I thought he had this hypersonic uh, missile to begin with. So what? Yeah. Who gives a shit how close? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's 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 strange factors. Uh, <laughs> it's it's. But I just think as well that the more you kind of antagonize somebody, the 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 worse it's going to be. You know yourself, even from a microcosm point of view. If you if if someone keeps bullying you and picking on you, and you're like, "I'll turn the other cheek." I'm not going to deal with this. This guy's a bit of an asshole. Sooner or later, you're just going to be like, right, I'm just going to fucking level this fucker. I'm going to knock him out. I'm going to drag him to the ground. Sooner or later, you're just going to be like, that's it. And I fear that's the case with Putin because I feel like there's this proxy war getting fought through Ukraine. And Zelensky, you know, is wearing his combats and, you know, like him or hate him. He's a polarizing character for me. Or sometimes I look at some, sometimes I look at Zelensky and I think I want to slap you in the face. And other times I applaud you, but you know, I think that there's a proxy war getting fought through Ukraine, the West versus Russia through Ukraine. So there's yeah, a bit yeah. of pu- puppetry right. going on there. But you think to yourself, sooner or later, keep poking him and Putin will react because he's hitting 70 now. He's yeah, thinking okay, about his legacy and he might just go, fuck it. I'll just level somewhere now and show ye fuckers what's going to happen because you annoyed me so much. Yeah. I, 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 I think he's capable of that, Gordon. That, that's just what I think. That oh, yeah. That, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, he believes, I mean, he obviously believes in the part of war is his terrorism, right? I mean, Sherman during the Civil War in the United States did that in the South. I mean, it's an old tactic, you know, mm-hmm. create terrorism and break down the, um, yeah. Um, but it's not, not like provoking him, like we're provoking him. I don't, I, maybe provoke, maybe provoking isn't the, isn't the right word, but I just think what if, do we do? 
Well, I think we've, provo- I, I think we've, prov- we've, the West has provoked him since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Not provoked him. Yeah, that's has, true. That's has, true. Pro- has provoked Russia with the ever yeah. expanding um, NATO to the Definitely. east. When Thatcher, Bush, and Gorbachev, I think it was, signed a deal saying basically NATO won't expand. And what have NATO done ever since the 90s? Fucking expand. Exactly. Yeah. Like, come on, lads. Really? You're just going to, it's like taking over a street. And you're just going to completely wipe it out, like it's just. Oh, especially you're, you're, as paranoid as the Russians are. Exactly. Given their history, right? Between yeah. Napoleon, Hitler, yeah, it was dumb. It was a dumbass move. And now you've got this. I think there's the other part. Then is I think the other part that people aren't probably maybe thinking about is the whole thing. What's that uh, philosopher's name? Is it Dugan, Kieran? Alexander Dugan. Yeah. Dugan, yeah. So you start listening to some of his stuff, and you think if 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 Putin's on that side, and he's kind of believing that he's doing the Lord's work and he's in this whole, you know, a spiritual revitalization that Putin's supposed to be going through. And he thinks that Russia should be this big kind of empire again. That to me is probably a bit more scarier than provoking him because then he's on a mission and he's got this godlike complex. So that's the other thing that people don't really seem to get across in the news either. If this is, if this is the case, if Putin is some sort of like, you know, demigod, like <laughs> they were really fucked. Well, you know? wants to reestablish the, the Soviet, uh, he, he said that was the most humiliating thing that could possibly happen to Russia was this breakdown of the Soviet empire, right? I mean, so mm. um, what falls from that? Do you think of going to Poland, even though NATO's, they're, they're a NATO country? That's the, that's so the fear, isn't it, that you keep rolling into Poland and places yeah. like this. And and then it's like, what to do? It's like, it's, it, I, I keep coming back, and even I picked up your book recently, Garden, when, when I, was, I was writing another essay, and, and I remember that the one of the last chapters you had, it might have even been the last one. There was a lovely, there was some really nice writing on forgiveness. And uh, I was thinking, because I thought about this a bit when it, as it comes to China, you know, thinking about what could be done. Because if, if I was trying to put myself for other, other stuff I was writing in the shoes of Communist Party members in China, just to use China as, right. to build it, just like Zen, yeah. of even if I had an inkling that I wanted to stop the suppression of what was going on in Xinjiang with the, with the Uyghurs and the Tibetans and to stop, uh, you know, putting journalists in prison and political dissidents and getting them killed and executing people and all this. I wanted to stop all that. And I wanted to open up the society and create a, a, the, the biggest, a, a, an actual democracy, democratic situation. There's a reality to by the time it takes, by the time you're at high level Chinese Communist Party member, you've had to do some really nefarious shit to get to that, or at least sanction it, if not do it yourself, to get to that position where you're potentially thinking about, well, if, if we do this, the people that we fucked over, their families, international tribunals are going to come in and we're going to get Nuremberg 2.0. So it's like, there's a resistance there, even from like a, self, a self-preservation perspective to yeah. not allowing a democratization to, a, to, to, to allow the country to become run by rule of law rather than rule by law. And when you take that same thing and you, whereas that doesn't necessarily what has, that, hasn't, that isn't necessarily what has to happen for the, you know, obviously a lot of fucked up things have taken place in the name of the greater good. But in terms of if there was international agreements made across the board, it's like, look, for the long-term benefit of humanity, this is just China now, for example, it would be better off. We'll help you democratize. We're not going to allow foreign interests to plunder your resources. We're going to figure out some way of trying to de- learn from what happened in the fall of the Soviet Union and the oligarchies and stuff that formed. And we're going to figure out a way of, ha- of, not, of, of learning from those mistakes. And all your slates are cleaned. We're not going to do a walk. We're not going to do human rights tribunals. We're, not going to, we're just going to look, let you, just like what happened after World War II with a lot of the, Japanese generals and Japanese researchers in like Unit 731, which is at least as bad, if not worse, than fucking Auschwitz and what they did to Chinese people and this oh research. Listen, and they, they, they said that rape in Nanking. Oh, that's they crazy. They, yeah. They that's, made the Nazis sick. Yeah, that is yeah, the, crazy. Yeah. The rape, where the rape in Nanking was so bad, there was Nazi diplomats helping smuggle oh, Chinese yeah. people out of the city. Do you know? So like, but there was no, but there was no Nuremberg for those people. So there, there was different agreements made, and there's historical precedents. Right. And it's easy to say, well, look at China now versus, whereas I think, or look at, sorry, look at J- Japan now and Germany now because of the plans that were put in place to help them. And obviously, it's a different world now. But okay, but if I, if you like you're correct, Putin, maybe you're saying we should calm down and let him yeah, burn himself but, out, even though I it think, causes but, 
but the but Ukrainians but, but, decided to fight them. You know, they 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 decided to to uh, yeah to fight that. That was their that that was a that was a radical choice there, right? I mean this yeah you know and um so if I understood what you were saying it might be the more humane thing to do would be let it burn itself out. I mean he's not gonna he's gonna be isolated. He's right. But and I think and and this is the and this is where I'm stuck because I'm I'm leaning towards that, but then also realizing the the situation that Ukraine, like Ian mentioned there, about funneling the weapons and all this kind of stuff that people are doing, where that, that the government's doing uh, flooding weapons in and helping Ukrainians. But the thing is, the Ukrainian people are, as you said, made the decision. They're stuck in the middle, and if they just surrender, who knows what's going to happen now that the blood's up and you know that what's that WBH line? The blood dim tide is loosed, and the Falcon can't hear the Falconer. And then when you see all that, um. Uh, if 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 those like atrocities that we see the footage that we see from um, the Busha or Buka, if that's if if that's anywhere near emblematic of what can happen with an undisciplined in uh, um, occupying force, that Russia is just in villages and doing getting up to business like that. Even if even if that was only a small microcosm, but but if you have enough of that going on, you could have if you have a small percentage of Russian brigades or whatever willing to do that but you have enough of those brigades spread out across ukraine you can end up with some really hairy stuff like horrid so imagine if you're in the ukrainian if you're in ukrainian boots you don't even they, they like the, the 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 thought of even surrendering is like okay if we surrender then what then what could happen so it's not even like just like it's all just going to go to peace for so this is just is just for ukrainians it's not sunshine and rainbows if they stop fighting and then if they so so they want to keep going which but then if there's this obligation that we feel in the West to, to, to support the input of weapons, to support them. But then like Teddy, but then from our perspective in terms of intervention, and I say, again, I say ours is in Ireland's a neutral country, but we're all adding momentum to this somehow in our posts, in our conversation. Oh, let's talk about it like it's, it's some, a fucking football game, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people yeah, are, but, 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 the language but, I hear is like, uh, they've been, I mean, it really is the kind of stuff that you're in a football game. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like this weird abstracted, but it, but the thing about it is from like a social perspective is conversations create kind of like a social swarms that, that tilt politicians in certain directions and tilt yeah. media. So these are, these are all, these are really, there is repercussions to even basic, com simple conversations, even if this wasn't going to be a podcast that was going to be recorded because it's influencing uh, opinion in our friend circles and their friend circles and so on and those yeah, ripples. Good yeah, no, no, sorry. But last night when I was ready to go ape shit, um, <laughs> I, was the, I was at the point at which I'm listening to the news. I try to I try to stay informed about what's going on there because actually my family, my, my wife's family is from Ukraine. They were just that. <laughs> so, but when I heard the report that they killed the two guys, people at the zoo. Did you hear about that one? No, I didn't. No. Oh. Oh. So there were two people that refused to leave, the two zookeepers that refused to leave the zoo. And the Russian shot them. Then I said, now it's time for the nukes then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, like, a, that's the red light. That was the red light. The zoo. No one goes into the zoo. Like, what? Are you kidding me? These people risked their lives to save these lions and the Russians just came in there and shot them. I mean, that's the... That's the wrong part of the brain I'm thinking from. I think you know, but right, that kind of that kind of stuff, you know. So, but but it is interesting, Gordon, to highlight that about you say about talking about like a football game. Your initial reaction to things, and then going through the talk kind of experiments with it. It is interesting because I think some people aren't getting past the football game. Some people aren't getting past the initial reaction. And some people aren't looking at the history or the current facts or the potential outcomes as well. Yeah, so okay, I think but they, okay, so so we screwed up with NATO. Does that, does that, does that justify him uh, mass graves? No, no. Oh. no, I know. No, so no. even if we were, were aware of the history, I agree with you, we made huge mistakes. The West made huge mis mistakes there. It was, cra it was crazy, especially, again, given the paranoia of Russians from the past, but um, what do we do now? Uh, but I, I think coming back to Karen's point and what you said as well, Gordon, about kind of just letting it burn out, I think there's two ways this is, this is getting fought at the moment. I think there's one is there's the economic sanctions that's gone on to Russia. And I think the fear, well, not the impact of that is that it's going to affect 
you know, a lot of everyday Russians. So potentially, will there be an internal uprising in Russia where people get sick of it because, you know, the value has gone down of the ruble, things are going on there as well. Then there's the impact of all these other countries like the Kazakhstans, who are probably yeah. a bit more kind of dependent on, on China. But I, I've been I've been to Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan does a lot of business with Russia. Then you've got Turkmenistan, the Kyrgyzstans, all these. And they got Triple G too. <laughs> we got all of these countries here that kind of feed off Russia, just like Australia yeah. feeds off China. Yeah. So they're going to start getting impacted by it as well. They're going to start getting fucking pissed off. So that that's one part. There's all that kind of economic bleed out, and I think that you know Boris Johnson and Biden are going to try and bleed out Russia economically for a long time. Then the other part about it is, which I empathize with the Ukrainians, is Ukrainians, and, and some historians have drawn the parallels between the Ukrainian people and Irish people like in the conflict with Britain. I understand how why Ukrainian people are just fucking pissed off and they don't care about what the West is doing. They're like, we've had enough of this and we're just going to fight. And we've, we're fucking we sick to death. There serious killing during World War II, though, too. Yeah. We're, we're, the we're, history during World War II wasn't, wasn't particularly pleasant. Yeah, and 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 the other thing, Gordon, as well as let's not forget that some of the stuff that's going around at the moment about what the Ukrainian um, armed forces or militia are doing to Russian people, Russian soldiers, is right. quite brutal as well. It's going both ways. Right. I have seen videos of Ukrainian soldiers crucifying Russian people and kicking Russian people to death. There is right. some horrific stuff going around on both sides. Now, I'm not justifying one side or the other. It doesn't mean they're equal. It doesn't mean it's equal. equal. I'm just, uh, it, but I understand where that's coming from because yeah. I understand how, why Ukrainians are so pissed off. And then I understand why Russia is going in as well, on the other hand, too. It's not the fact that I support it. It's just on either yeah. hand. I take, the, I actually take, personally, I take the Martin Luther King stance. I think no good comes from war. And I think, you know, he was a Rodney King thing. Can't we just all get along? We shouldn't have never. the the the, the, right. goal, the goal is not to get to this. This this is the goal, is That's not right. to get to this. And we should learn from this for future gen, future areas because we have China looking down the barrel of Taiwan, and I and I can tell you here in Australia, if Australia does the same thing to China that the West is doing to Russia, Australia will fall apart because if we do economic sanctions on China, we're fucked in Australia because especially well, in Western it's, Australia. It's, Especially in Western Australia, we're so linked to China in terms of iron ore yeah. supply and gas and yeah, all yeah. these other trade. We're done. We're, yeah. you, you, you might as well wish for a nuclear fucking winter because you're going to starve anyway. It's done. Right. So we need to learn from this for future things as well. I'm not saying everything is the same, but again, like a lot of these podcasts that Karen and I do, we're not coming up with any answers. We're probably coming up with more problems yeah, we than, any, know. than anything. Come Let's come up with an answer, man. I think your answer is right. I think... Uh... Uh, I, I think we should be very cherry of uh, starting a nuclear war there going in, from what you're saying. I, I, I think, I mean, I think I have a most very emotional reaction, combat sport type, you know. Yeah. Use a bully, you got to stand up to a bully, all yeah. that crap, right? You know, but I think you're right. I think we should just ch choke them off financially, gradually. And uh, I mean, it was a Ukraine decision to stay in fight. As I said, they yeah, yeah, yeah. Done what, the, what the Danes did, they fought for six hours. And they said, fuck it, let them come in. They had a great resistance. They saved thousands of Jewish people, you know. Mm. And, some, uh, some, just, some, some people say that the Danes were actually, there is, a, there is another, I've read some stuff saying that the Danes were actually Nazi sympathizers and it wasn't as clear cut. It's just no, like there would have been some Danes hey, that was the case. I lived in Denmark for years. So, yeah, there were about 2%. There's always been about 2%, <laughs> yeah. 3% of the, Danes that were, you know, right, right wing, but yeah. by and large, I, mean, I knew in most countries, yeah, someone will identify as Jewish before their nationality. And uh, mm. in Denmark, people have to be reminded they're Jewish. You know, so they, they were very, had a really strong resistance. And uh, the king wore a, wore a, um, wore the, they, they have the badge, the Jewish badge, wouldn't stand up when the Nazis came in, you know. Um, and uh, maybe that was the right thing. That maybe that was the right thing to do again, because we're not just talking about we're talking about the responsibility for people's lives who have nothing to do with this, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing with and the, with this the, the key component <clears throat> to this. That's I think I think a key component on this, and what I, this is what I was getting to with the speak softly bit, is that there's the key component that's missing in all this is the 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 potential for forgiveness. And there's, it's like Putin is like becoming this, um, 
uh, lightning rod for angst and existential uh, angst right. and yeah, just yeah, like yeah, projecting yeah. hatred and projecting mm. this is the new devil this yeah. is the replacement for hitler this is this is like oh, this new secular fucking right. state yeah, you're right you're right you're absolutely right you know like yeah. he, he's getting like and the even if he, he is provoked, a, the more he acts like a maniac i mean right yeah and, but it, but it, and, and i think even in terms of even in terms of just being able to make decisions in a clear with clearer head and just be able to have conversations that aren't as 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 uh, dramatic like an example of the kind of the way that this swarm can work and i use the word swarm i got it off this guy john robb who, who who's talked about this 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 mass swarm and how it's affected um even you, you can see it with companies like just the the almost instantaneous decision by independent companies to just pull out of russia because of public pressure and because it was going to affect their image it was like it was like this was the new thing. Like this was the new thing that we need to ver- signal our virtue by jumping on board this new wagon. Okay, we're going to cancel Russia. That's the new thing. Whereas before that, it was maybe COVID. And then before that, we were going to, I don't know, give a load of money to the Black Lives Matter organization or something. It was like, it was like, it was almost like it filled the slot of this is the new way of vir- brandishing our virtue. And that's all just public pressure. It's post, it's angry. And, and I think, this 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 level of being able okay, to recognize well, human and forgiveness. Would you, have said, would you have said the same thing about dealing with apartheid in South Africa? In and in companies what way? Pull, companies. Oh, oh, I'm not saying. Oh, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that it that it that it that they shouldn't have pulled out. I'm not saying yeah. they shouldn't have. I'm just saying the the, the speed of it was oh, just yeah, yeah. The, the, the you know because of the momentum that built so fast because of the, the like swarm of energy in that direction because of social media and the share of information and it happened so quickly whereas there was it would have been I don't I don't know the, the, the history of the apartheid but I can imagine just because of information technology and the share the spread how fast things spread that it was a much slower process and that there yeah, it was yeah yeah, yeah. Do you know so yeah. like but and in terms of so it's more that recognizing that the conversations that we have and the things that we and discuss in, in person and, and on the internet do add momentum in certain directions. And then it's, but it's, it's also holding in our head, like, and I genuinely, I think that you, you wrote this brilliantly in, 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 in towards the end of your book around forgiveness. And in, and if we don't have the capacity to recognize the potential for goodness in the people that we, it's all too easy for us to dehumanize, then we're right. fucked. It's just gonna, you're, it just becomes a demonization Dehumanization, demon, de, de, uh, demonization, and destruction. That's like the pathway. Like denigrate, no, humanize, no, demonize, no, destroy. As long as they don't kill the zookeepers, though, man, that's it. <laughs> but Gordon, you bring up an interesting point there about apartheid, and and that's an interesting one as well. I've spent some time in South Africa I, back about twenty years ago. I spent two months backpacking around, so nearly two thousands, and I went there a lot for work as well. So I've seen sort of the division still in South Africa that's there. And there's also a lot of, we'll say, I suppose you want to classify them as white Afri- African people from Johannesburg and South Africa here in Western Australia because it's so close. A lot of them have come to live here. That's interesting. But also, it, it makes me also think about, I've thought I've thought a bit about apartheid, but it also makes me think about what's going on in Russia. One's internally to, one's internal to South Africa and one is external, what Russia is doing to Ukraine. But I also think another point about would say sanctions or you know restrictions or financial stuff. It's not affecting Putin. It's affecting people like me, you, and Kieran. So if we were in Russia today and we didn't agree with Putin, why do we have to suffer for that fuckhead? Why does my business? Why can't I take in money through you know a Mastercard, Visa? If I have an online shop, I'm suffering because of some asshole. Even though I didn't vote for him, you can imagine people suffering in America under Biden's administration, but there were Trump supporters or vice versa. You know. What, why, why is it that we allow these, you know, we think that these restrictions are going to be helpful when we're just basically vilifying innocent people within a country who may not avoid in that regime? That's another thing as well that I think, you know, is, is, quite, is quite damaging, really, because what Karen is saying about seeing the good in other people, we're going to put a lot of people offside by these sort of tactics also. And the sanctions, you think? We shouldn't even sanction, there shouldn't be financial sanctions against them? I don't know. I'm not, no, I'm not saying there shouldn't be, but I'm just saying just the ramifications. If you start thinking about who they're going to hit, imagine if you were, if there were sanctions on America tomorrow, Gordon, and you couldn't you couldn't earn a living. Yeah, 
because of what Biden did. And let's say, for example, you were a Trump or a, I don't yeah. pick, pick any other side, like a Bernie Sanders, whatever. Let's say you supported Bernie Sanders or, or somebody else. And then Biden was in and, and Russia went or all, all of the other countries of Europe and we're going to do sanctions on America because we think Biden has dementia and we don't want to support him. So you're all going to have sanctions. And now, Gordon, you can't earn a living. How would you feel about that? I'd be angry. You know, exactly. You know? And that's why I just wonder about the ramifications of the sanctions as well, sometimes about what we're doing, because we're just turning. Oh, well, but, but it would depend on, for example, if I, if I found out that uh, we had we were, the sanctions were the result of uh, our, uh, we, our practicing slavery right now, I'd be angry about the, the practice and pissed off about mm. losing my job. But so if I knew something about the reasons for the sanctions, that would make a difference, wouldn't it? Oh, of, it, it, of course. On that, yeah. And it's on that point, though, about knowing something about the reasons. This is something that you mentioned earlier on, Ian, about the censoriousness of the climate. So and this, our, our, our political and cultural climate, the censorious nature of it, where there's all these new hate speech laws. Mm-hmm. Like There's a new one I read today that they're bringing in in England, this online harm bill, and where they're trying to criminalise the, the, the potential that someone might cause offence with something. It's just these bizarre attempts yeah. to try and regulate yeah. speech. And um, but any, but like, but the way that this like you, you alluded to it there, and I wanted to ask about this is that uh, is is this kind of notion of leading by example? So, like you had mentioned, um, Gordon in the piece around slamming us against our values and what we actually what do we actually care about? The, something that's re- that I'm really sensitive to is this censoriousness, and I was really annoyed when Western this government, like the EU, I don't know what the story is like in America, but big tech companies and the European Union, I know shut down Russia today and um, these other kind of Russian state news channels. And then it was, I think it might've been after that, that the Russians did the same with, with BBC or Deutsche Welle or whatever. And um, because it was like, because they were afraid that Russia today was going to broadcast propaganda in, in the West. And I just, that irked me a lot because it then it seemed to me to be an opportunity to be able to lead by example, because if information could get back to Russia somehow through people who have VPNs or way of getting onto the internet and getting access to, to media in the West. And if it was no, if it could become known to people in Russia that we were allowing all their media to be shown here because we trusted our population to be able to f- analyze what they were seeing and we actually trust them like yeah fair enough look if you want to look at russian propaganda russian state media tear away do your thing whatever it's like we trust you to make your own decisions and, and evaluate the evidence but but then if it, it makes their sensorial yeah yeah uh, snipping of bbc and deutsche Welle and everything look then like their government is the one whereas when both do it i know it's wartime and it's dramatic but it's the trend that our population, that our big tech and everything in the European government were already taking, European Union and stuff were already taking with trying to like limit misinformation or hate speech, which is these amorphous terms that can basically mean whatever they want it to mean based on their particular preferences. Right. And the fact that we started going in that direction, it just seems like totally contrary to what I'd see as fundamental kind of like Western values, which what underpins the best things about the West, like about democracy and free and science and rule of law is like the capacity to freely exchange ideas and the capacity to openly critique any idea, so, you know, like open exchange yeah, of information. So, okay, so we had the, uh, so when uh, we, we pulled out of Afghanistan, the United States, uh, we bombed the civilian um, van, which was, was, was uh, in the beginning was claim was terrorist. They reported on that, the US. My Land Massacre reported on that. Uh, mm. We reported on the uh, tor- uh, on the torture that you, some Ukrainians are inflicting upon Russian prisoners. So mm. uh, I, don't, I don't think you, I don't think you, our friend Putin would be doing that. So no, not there. at all. Yeah, I think there's something. So I, I there's definitely a difference. There's definitely a difference. It's more. It's more the. It's more the ability to lead by example by not trying to censor or shut down their attempts at news and prop- or if, if, or how much or propaganda, you know, like, or, or, or like, not, no, not look, that we're look, at the, look at the impact. 
look at the impact the Russians had on our last election. Uh, I mean, the election before when the douchebag Trump got elected, right? I mean, they were falsifying all kinds of, I mean, tons of stuff on Facebook. So uh, uh, I'm glad they're trying to censor some of that stuff. And they used to, to try, try to manipulate people and they were, they were successful, very good at it. So I mm. think we're, I, I see what you're saying, but I, I think at least in the United States, they've reported some terrible things we've done. You know, mm. and uh, hey baby, we're, we're gonna come to an answer to our question. I think we're coming to, we're not gonna be one of these things where we're leaving it open like, <laughs> I don't like that shit. Uh, we're gonna stay. No, so I, I, aren't we coming to the agreement that even if they kill another zookeeper, <laughs> even if they killed an, another zookeeper, we should try to calm things down, let it let it burn out, not demonize, not not demonize uh, Putin or provoke him in unnecessary ways. Yeah, I and, I, uh, I think not, Gordon, if not, I'll I'll make a stance here. I'm going to make my position clear on both. I'll I'll kick it off. I'll say which what I think might need to happen for some sort of peaceful end to this. I think number one, I don't think I don't. There's no benefit to any nuclear weapon getting fired. So that's that's first of all. I think at the macro level, we can't have that. That that just cannot happen any shape, way, or form. The second thing is that, to your point, we need to stop poking the bear. We need to fucking relax. The next thing we need to do is we need to look at what is a peaceful end to the conflict in Ukraine on the ground for Ukrainian people versus Russian soldiers. That may be, unfortunately, within Ukraine, creating some space, a ceasefire for a period of time, for Zelensky and Putin or whatever to sit down and go, right, how are we going to work this out? And it may be the fact that those three areas, one which has been given up already, Crimea, and the other two provinces within Ukraine or states, may need to be part of Russia. Because a lot of those people in those provinces or states identify yeah. as being Russian, 70 to 80% right. of people. So is it a case of we'll get to there, we'll sign some sort of agreement now, there has been agreements like that in the past. I think Poland signed an agreement over 100 years ago in Ukraine called uh, the Treaty of Everlasting Peace, which obviously fucking never happened in Ukraine. But if we signed, if we have this agreement <laughs> and we have, you know, this kind of, right, these states here are going to be here. These are going to be, these are going to be Russian states now. And this is going to be Ukraine. And you shall not go past. We won't have the West come into Ukraine, but they'll be at the borders. And if you encroach on any of those levels, then we are going to join NATO and NATO needs to back up and go, if Russia encroaches on that, there needs to be some like hard rules. If you cross those lines, then we are going to fucking come in on a land assault because that, that's the only way I think it's going to come over. I, I just cannot see Ukraine getting full control of Ukra the Ukrainian people getting full control of Ukraine again. And I can't see the Russians completely taking over Ukraine. And because if Russia takes over Ukraine, oh, they they're not going to hold it. They're not going to hold it. It's going to be guerrilla warfare forever. No. They're not going to hold it. And what you're saying is they, they, this way, Putin could back, could claim some victory and move out. Exactly. Everybody's going to win. I think you have to give up a little to gain a lot. And if Zelensky is a true leader, he should be avoiding debts of his people. Now, I understand that there's other things that are, are, are not tangible or things that we can't quantify, like the spirit of the Ukrainian people. And I don't think Ukrainian people, from my point of view, should see that as a defeat. They might have to see it as the best possible outcome here. And I think we've seen that sort of thing happen in, in places like Ireland or other countries as well. And whilst it's not nice, these things happen and borders have right. continually changed in the world. It's not like these borders were established 3,000 years ago in every country and have stayed the same. Look at America. America okay, had wait, like well, French territory second, and Spanish on. territory. Okay, so but, this happens. Yeah. Okay, but suppose... Um... Suppose he then goes into Poland and finds an excuse to go into Poland. Then we fucking ready guns and blazes. Then we're ready for nuclear there. war. Well, I don't know if it's nuclear war, but we have to do something then because well, that's, that's he, striking I mean, a NATO country. So then you say, then then it'll be okay to uh, if you use tactical nuclear weapons to uh, to respond in kind. I, I think the word tactical nuclear weapons can never be used. There's no such thing as tactical. Uh, but I think, on, I, but, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I think then there has to be something, something, some sort of force engagement has to happen then because you're entering into it. You set those terms with Putin. You let him, you get him, give him a little victory. You let him go back. If he comes into Poland or any other NATO country, if he goes into Poland, it's the same as him walking into the US, in my opinion. 
Then okay. it's on. Then it's on like Donkey Kong. Okay. Because it's a NATO country. You, ha- you have to, Gordon. Yeah, you, ha- you can't. Oh, I hear you. I, I, you have I, to draw a line in the sand. The other thing is, yeah. you can't let fucking tyrants walk all over you. But you can't just go in guns a blazing straight away all the time. You should talk down the situation and de-escalate. And then the minute people want to... Fucking give- Mary, the US did that in World War II. Fucking uh, England was being bombed to shit. And, and we didn't do anything except send weapons until the Japanese bombed the... Pearl Harbor. Bombed Pearl Harbor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Churchill was furious. I mean, it was only England was the only country because America was so isolationist after World War One. But, but so but, you're saying, okay, so wait a second. I'm just trying. Yeah. I understand your answer correctly. Is you try to cool the situation down. Yeah. But if he steps over the line at Poland or yeah. Romania, yeah. then we're ready to nuke. That's that's my current position. Yeah. Yeah, ready to that, nuke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's I don't think it's nuke through it. Gordon, you love going to the nuke. I know, is this such? <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, if he if he's crazy enough, if he's, oh, wouldn't you say that after all this, if Putin's willing to do that, then he'd be willing to use strategic nuclear weapons. Yeah, I, I don't want to go to nuclear weapons straight away. I think if he, I know if, you don't, but we're not <laughs> sticking. We're not answering the question. What's the question? The, okay, so you said, okay, we let it, we, 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 we let it, we let it kind of smolder in Ukraine, but if yeah. it takes one step over that line into Poland, we we send in troops. Yeah. And if we, and now the Russian military is obviously not that. Where, where's the where, where's the strength of the Russian military in their nuclear? They need arms? to blow shit up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's all. They, they're really not a very. I mean, by all yeah. accounts. Have a very strong military, and they're not even in America. So you're saying, comes to Poland, Romania, Denmark, Denmark, I'm fight for Italy. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's like or zookeepers. <laughs> zookeepers. <laughs> but, but I think <laughs> I think it, I, but I, I think a, a key. I I I I think that that uh, that Teddy Roosevelt line needs to be the kind of motto of the whole thing. It's like figure out what the actual and, and it's not going to be they're not going to publicly say what that red line is or the politicians but the intent would be that there's a readiness here and one side is like the hand of peace of being able to say we want peace a peaceful resolution to this mm-hmm. as fast as possible and we want that we want this violence to stop no no fucking stop Everyone stop shooting. If and if we can get a ceasefire going, and if the Ukrainians kick off and end the ceasefire, then there's a, then there's 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 there's, uh, there's grounds there to stop supporting them if they kick back off, and if the Ukrainians kick off, then there's grounds to escalate. But it's like let's just stop fighting now and let's actually try and resolve this exactly. peacefully because yeah. this could spiral into the dark abyss of annihilation or whatever way fucking Martin Luther King put it. But on the other hand is the big stick. You know, it's like that genuine attempt to, to, and, but within that attempt is the capacity to forgive and the capacity to recognize shared humanity and errors. And the fact that not everyone in this Russian administration was trying to go out to do harm, that they were being taught what to do. And then there was other people who did horrendous things like these mass graves and, killing civilians and it's about but at the same time it, it needs to be it needs to be this response that strikes that balance between a genuine okay, willingness to forgive and preserve that, life excuse me can i answer back to that one <laughs> yeah please uh, gordon marino I'm from the democratic party here. <laughs> Dem- okay, gordon marino from the democratic uh, party you have the floor <laughs> putin has a, a, a rich history in chechnya georgia Syria, right? Chemical weapons there. Yeah. Back to Syrians, and the and most commentators that I've heard said that he doesn't. He he only responds to strength, strength not weakness. Yeah. So That's the big stick. Uh, okay. Yeah. That well, the big stick is like Biden's got to tell him you kill one more zookeeper. I'm gonna we're gonna blow. We're gonna we're yeah. gonna send the nukes in. We're not yeah. doing that. we It was just what Roosevelt did with a uh, Churchill. He said. We'll arm you, but we're not going to fight. Like and my, my, yeah, because my, my actual intuition that's not rationally grounded in anything, it's just an intuition, is to basically just throw it out on the table and basically say, look, man, stop talking about fucking nukes. We have nukes too. 
Go back. Just take <laughs> it handy. Relax. Relax, man. Look, let's stop fucking violence. Let's stop this. This is going to escalate and everyone's going to die. Everyone. We'd all fucking die. Let's not have that. If you let's just stop fighting, let's go to the negotiation table, let's figure something out. And that's the best way to go about this. Because otherwise you kick off, we have to escalate, and all of a sudden everyone's yeah, yeah, dead. I agree. Then? I agree. You know, and I, that, my, my intuition is that it's like the big stick is a key well, component that, to right? this. He knows it. Well, yeah. I don't know. I don't know whether he knows. There's a lot of, a lot of different reports on what kind of mind he has, you know. Um, yeah. Because but that's yeah. but I think from all a lot of what I've heard about him is this this is that uh and i think just they think we, we we joked about it before actually on this podcast where we talked about um we were looking across our current uh, geopolitical landscape at the various leaders of the big countries and we were like well if 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 the independence day aliens showed up you know in real life and uh who would you actually want to be your your commander in chief you know and we were gonna have we was before <laughs> which is months ago we were joking well the only the only political leader we can see who actually Looks like he has it. He has it, he's up to scratch. Like, is it Boris Johnson? No. Is it Biden? No. Is it we're going to Justin Trudeau is going to lead the lead the lead the cavalry charge against the independent? No. It's Vladimir Putin was the fella. We were like, he's the only <laughs> one that we, can, you know. So like, um, but I think in that because he's like the, that component. But it, I think what are it's very it's it's very odd in that so much of the 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 narrative is very. Um, in the media, it's so there's an obviously there's like telling the American the, the sports game view of it, just like commentary, yeah. but it's also totally detached. Maybe it's just an, a lack of awareness of what the consequence of nuclear weapons use would actually be, you know, in terms of the in detail and actually what would what would the consequences be. But even there's also this kind of uh strange, just either this really gun ho naive, let's just go to fucking war mentality that's totally uh, oh no, no or maybe there's here. sorry no 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 one's saying that here if any, if anything they're kind of indifferent to what's going on on some level yeah no we, we I, I see stuff here and maybe it's just be, being in europe and everything and, yeah. and i see some i see some kind of gun whole stuff but then it's also there's this there's this uh that's but then it, but then the difficulty comes where is the red line and I, I find the red line harder to draw at the nato thing because then it just means dragging this conflict out. And, and, and as this conflict gets dragged out longer and longer, first of all, you obviously have what we've talked about of the potential that at any moment things could escalate, even with just a nuclear accident. Oh, yeah. You know, accidents can happen. Even, even if no one intends to do something, all of a sudden there's a miscommunication, yeah. technological failure, human failure, something happens and a, and, a, and a mushroom cloud appears over a Russian military installation. And then, and then, and then it's fucking all hell breaks loose. But, but so, so I, I'm tilted towards putting the fucking line in the sand, not at a particular border, but just now, now fucking stop. Do you know, what? let's just stop fighting and let's Wait, figure something you out. You think, you think Putin's going to, you go up to Putin, who's fucking poisoned all kinds of people. You're going to say to him, hey, now let's stop fighting. You think yeah, he's gonna no, but, but it's, but it's, Come but on. it's to do that. But it, but the hard part is like, if, if, if not, then where does the line go? Because, if if the if if the line is more uh, geographical at a border, yeah, then mean, yeah. it can yeah. go on. Whereas if it's more like, look, we want a ceasefire as fast mm. as possible. Let's stop the violence. Let's cut it. We'll stop sending weapons in. We won't rearm during the ceasefire. The like, ceasefire is on. We're not going to just start using that opportunity to rearm. You do the same. Let's just let's just talk. Let's just settle. Put the put the tools down. But let's nobody, have a chat. But nobody trusts the Russians. I mean, they've had. A- Couple of, a couple of cases in which they supposedly had these corridors where people could escape and they shot the people. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it's not as mm. though there's a lot of trust in the West with, with the Russians about that stuff. And even go back historically, after World War II, uh, the Russian commander that came into Germany, and uh, I just read this book by a German uh, historian, said like two, three weeks, they were allowed to do whatever the fuck they wanted. You know, yeah, and, rape and village, was like Viking stuff, like. Yeah, 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 and that's who they're—that's actually who they're descended from, ultimately. You know, so yeah. I don't think there's a lot of trust in a ceasefire with Putin, right? So that's also a problem. You know. Yeah, but that's the component of the—that's the, the the interesting thing component of the nuclear weapons bit is it 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 makes it all so. Weapons. Sorry, chemical, chemical weapons. weapons. Yeah, chemical weapons go first. 
They've been used. It was a red line with, with chemical weapons, and we didn't do anything in Syria about it. Yeah. Uh, and then it, that, that's where it comes. And that's where yeah. it's like if if violence, if if the big stick is gonna come out, it's about there's a genuine readiness to use it. So it's like yeah. it, it, this is the this is so this is like the, the the finest line imaginable of like where as soon as you decide we're actually ready to go here, and then you and there's that intent of like we we want the violence to stop immediately, we want the peace fire, the, the, the ceasefire. And if not, then we're rolling into Ukraine. Do you know, like it's that kind of intent because, yeah, the, 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 we, and, 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 the, and it can be really clear. And look, we'll have a conversation around you, and the Ukrainians are going to have to lose territory here. And that's going to be part of the conversation that has to happen. And then it's like, but it's when you see the human suffering that's taking place, and then you realize. That if you, 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 know, you you know when you read stuff about the beginning of the first world war, the beginning of the second world war, and the history, and you know when you you come across stuff like these newspaper reports that are like from these uh, primary sources from the from the time. This is only going to last a month. Oh, yeah. This is only going to last yeah, yeah, yeah. six yeah. weeks yeah. or two months, and then our troops are going to come home. And, yeah. and you look that this could be just years of Ukrainian civilians being caught in the middle of carnage, just like hell on earth for years, and then in the same time. You end up with Russia being turned into an enormous North Korea that's just detached from the rest of the world yeah, yeah. and ends up with a population that's just totally cut off, totally blocked off with this elite group of the, the elites that have that are totally fine with, 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 with their caviar and their, their money and everything. They'll be grand, but it's the regular people, like Ian was saying. Yeah. So it, it kind of comes down to... And then in that situation, you still might end up with um, <laughs> a nuclear accident at some point that that during a war escalates. So it's like my my intuition is just big stick in one hand and then the olive branch in the other hand, let's have a chat. If we're if not, fuck it, let's have a go. But, and but it's the, like, count, the, count, the counter argument to that thing, Karen, is I'm what happened. I'm so glad we came to a mature conclusion. I don't think the big stick, the the uh, the, the, the big stick then the quiet being quiet on the it, uh, Putin's a different kind of animal. People say he needs the big stick. Well, maybe he it needs to be a stick. maybe it needs to be a bigger stick then. <laughs> it's a bigger let stick him, than the olive branch. Let, let, let Vitaly let Vitaly Klitschko and Vladimir take care of it. <laughs> yeah, but just to, just to, just, to, just to, I don't know about those guys because you know their father died in Chernobyl. He died from Chernobyl. He mm -hmm. was in charge of the um, <clears throat> he had lots of he was, he was in charge of the cleanup there a lot and died from cancer from it and. See Chernobyl bond in Chechi it must be. But you know, yeah. okay, so we, I, I, our, our view would be that Ukrainians, if they want to keep this, if it's going to keep going, they got to take responsibility for it, and we're not going to risk a nuclear war over it, right? As it stands right now, is that our conclusion? I, I, I think so. I think I think yeah. I think that's a that's a fair assessment, yeah. But I also think on the back of that, then there needs to be to nearly like pre-World War II with Neville, Neville Chamberlain, there needs to be some part of appeasement or peace talks to stop this getting any worse. And look, if you look at what happened in World War II, Chamberlain and Hitler sat down and discussed, they allowed Hitler to go into the Sudetenland and then sort of the following year yeah. when he started going into parts of Poland and everything, then they were like, right, you're fucked now. We give you a chance, yeah. we give you a peace and now it's on. Now, some people say that they shouldn't have appeased him. They should have went in and just hammered him straight away. But to give him the benefit of the doubt, they tried to appease to him. And I think the same should be done to Putin. We need to sit down in a bit more of a peaceful manner, try and do that. Yeah, but the argument there was, if we, if we had dealt with him that in the beginning, he wouldn't have the strength to do what he did with Hitler. Well, so that's... There's a analogy there. There's a, that, that's that, right. That was yeah. the claim, is that <clears throat> if we stopped him right away, and there's also a lot of Germans who are against him at that point. That's right, you know, yeah. And, wasn't so so we got to be careful i don't think we want to mm. map those two situations on one another but, no, it, but, the, but there is similarities well, as, yeah. As, yeah but i think as a, a big a, a, an, in, an interesting difference between hitler the hitler of then and, and germany apart from any of the personality or the ideology and all that stuff it's more that putin is at a situation where he's at a kind of almost uh in terms of what's most concerning about the putin regime they're already at peak capacity in terms of you know, like six and a half thousand weapons, 
totally right. isolated from the population, totally unaccountable to the population, already blocked off from the rest of the world economically, apart from one, as, or, right. but obviously right. the oil and the gas or whatever. So it's yeah. like they can't really get more dangerous than they are. Unless, yes, okay. unless, yeah. unless, unless Putin has banged, like, slips in the shower and bangs his head and starts becoming erratic or something, it's like, you know. So yeah. it's like yeah. it's almost like there's peak peak threat is already staring us in the face. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, 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 whereas the likes of uh, Hitler was able to use that time to build more technology, build more airplanes, build more bombs, get more, you know. Um, more, 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 more economic development and stuff to get to get the weaponry right. and everything. So I, I, I like, but I think that 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 kind of I don't know. My, I, I, I would have that intuition of like trying to put put a put a put it get the ceasefire asap, and that the intervention would come off the back of a failure to abide by the ceasefire rather than crossing certain borders because oh, wait, they've already had plenty of cease. He's got a, he's got. He's got a history of ceasefires which he just ignored. In Syria, yeah, but but that's but but mm. but when the but when the big stick is out, this is this is where the, what do you mean the big stick. The, what do you mean when the what do you mean when the big stick is out? Yeah, but, it, it, but 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 that is, if it's going to be if it's going to be brandished, that it's ready to use, and that's like it's like my, that's the, this is this is not logical. This is not rational. This is not logic. There's nothing about this that's. Uh, that's like that I can justify, but it's like this, and I'm not saying I mean, it's probably a good thing I'm not a fucking politician. But my my intent, my my thing would be like, we let's just put a halt, put the brakes on, let's let's sit down, let's 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 uh, resolve this peacefully, less bloodshed as possible. Ukrainians are going to have to lose some territory. You get to go home with some territory, and we figure out what that territory is going to be. But if you if you don't abide by the, the the ceasefire, then we're going to have war. And if it's nuclear war, so be it. If humanity ends, so be it. But we need to put an end. Oh, to that's, the, the, the risk. that's easy for you to say. <laughs> yeah, you that, I'm not saying it's. I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm just saying where my <laughs> intuition is at the moment. <clears throat> okay, but at least I'm, we. I, I got to go. I, I, I think at, least, at least, at least we concluded that you know, we should. Yeah. We should be careful. Not have me in politics. That's the best conclusion. <laughs> is that they shouldn't win politics. Especially when they start. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we did. We did. I think we got a conclusion, don't we? That uh, we shouldn't risk nuclear war. We shouldn't escalate yeah. things at this at this point. We have, have a little I bit agree. of a difference about whether we're still not sure about where the red so-called red line would be. You know that that was something we really haven't concluded. But we're saying no, we shouldn't. Um, we shouldn't do anything more to, and not, not to demonize, not to get involved and turn uh, Hitler and, I'm sorry, Putin into Hitler, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd he, agree with those points. Although yeah. he's getting there. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah. I mean, but the, but the fast, but the you imagine the balmy man. The guy gets poisoned, almost dies, and comes back. And goes Russia. back to Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about some courage, huh? Yeah. Or that woman who jumped in front of the TV set. About the, the oh TV yeah! Oh man, some inspiration those people. I think. But as 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 in a, as a kind of a, a related aside to that, there's something that there was there was only a, essays I was reading today by this guy Fang Li Ji, who was a Chinese dissident and he was a physicist, cosmologist, and he ended up needing to leave Beijing after is it Beijing? I believe Beijing, I think, in 1990 because he ended up in a political asylum with the American embassy until maybe the middle of 1990 after the Tiananmen Square massacres. And um, he was one of the kind of leading dissidents at the time in terms of trying to reform the Chinese political situation. Right. And, um, and I, I couldn't help but think of him earlier on when we were talking about the difference in the Chinese values because what's so hard to, this maybe is a separation a conversation for another day, but, um, but I think it's so hard to parse out the values from, as you said earlier on, the cultural norms and the cultural expectations. Because when I read his writings about, when obviously he's biased because he's a scientist and a physicist who was craving the free exchange of information. Oh, and they go way, way. The artist, the artist. He just wrote as uh, the the dissident artist in China and what he went yeah. through. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. So 
he wasn't a scientist. He's a yeah, 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 yeah. And when, and when you see the size of those protests, the Tiananmen Square protests and everything, which and they said, don't remember. I had a graduate student here because uh, I run this Kierkegaard Library, which you guys don't know about Kierkegaard yet, but. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, no, but so people, ooh. so I, a scholar from uh, China come, they barely knew about Tiananmen Square. Graduate yeah. students. That's just the, and in terms of your, uh, your, your, your idea of the thought control, there it is, man. And who's a yeah. graduate student? It's like, yeah, Tiananmen Square, what wasn't. There's also people in the West Garden that didn't know about the Berlin Wall. So <laughs> that's true. Part, 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 part of its curation of information, there are parts just fucking idiocy and not knowing history. That's the other thing, too. Like I am surprised. Because people who don't surpri- know who even won the Earl Spence uh, Ugas fight this weekend, you can imagine. That. <laughs> There's people who get, people not even going to fucking watch the Fury fight this weekend, I'll gentlemen. We've been going for uh, we've been going for about an hour and forty five, and I know it's oh, you late. You guys are too much fun, man. You guys too much fun. It uh, Karen has to go out to bed because it's about four o'clock in the morning for him or something. Oh, I have- sorry. I, I, I have to go out to work. I have to go out to work in about 10 minutes. And Gordon, you need probably to go and have your dinner. It's probably uh, dinner time for you, is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's great to see you guys. Thanks for as a, as a, I, it's, it's, This was excellent, Gordon. Yeah. As a parting note on a mutual love of ours, boxing, uh, how do you think the Fury's fight going to go? Do you, think, do you think he'll stop Dillian White? I haven't, I, I haven't seen White fight. What's he like? Is he a He's, puncher? Uh, he, he he can bang all right, but he's really um, he's really he he he's really messy, <clears throat> but in messy messy in a really effective way. Like he's he's kind of like swinging overhand Brawler, shots, yeah. you know, like and is which he? is which is really hard to time. And if he gets in close yeah. on Fury, they have these swinging overhandy shots that that are. I, I think he could be a hassle, but I just I, I actually am really struggling to see anyone beat Fury. Um, Oh, he can see punches. He can see punches coming. Great. He's, uh, yeah. I, I talked to him about fought him, and he said it doesn't hit hard, but uh, you can't see where the punches are coming from because he's yeah. all over the place. You know? Yeah. yeah and, he, and he's switching stances he's so calm and combinations. And, and he's so calm and violent too. And he's got a he's got a chin like unbelievable, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Look at what Deontay did to him. And he just got about. It's like he's like he was like fucking. He was like someone getting about with a coffin. Like a zombie, it was, like yeah. not put me. Yeah, it was what the equivalent of burying some going to a funeral, and burying someone, and then someone yeah. coming out of the ground. It was like unbelievable. Yeah. Like I yeah. never saw it. That was when you got to check out when Ken Norton got. Was it was it, it was a Nor? I think it was Norton Shavers. Shavers, yeah, no, no, no it was Holmes. Holmes, uh, Holmes Shavers. And Shavers, uh, Holmes, Shavers hit him, knocked him down, and uh, Holmes said he hit him so hard that he woke him up. You can still feel it. And he said <laughs> if he hit him a little bit less hard, he would have been out. <laughs> <laughs> nice to talk to foreigner in the international affairs with you guys. Yeah. Right, guys. I reckon six. I reckon six. I reckon six rounds in Fury. I'll have a. Oh man, I gotta, I gotta watch this now. Yeah. All right. Guys. All right, lads. Thank you very much for brilliant, chat, Gordon. Brilliant talking to you all. We'll uh, take it easy fun. and um, yeah, stay off the internet. <laughs> yeah, much love, lads. See you, lads. <laughs>